Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session, which is part of Greater Than Solstice Jamboree, a six week festival, um, an online sort of open space event where you can meet lots of people from the Greater Than ecosystem who are offering a variety of sessions, mostly for free to join. So if you haven't checked out the program, take a look. There's still a bunch of other sessions planned going until the end of July. And so today we're here. Um, I'm Francesca Pick. I'm here with my colleague, Alicia Trepat, and we're here to talk about the subject of uh, whether scaling thriving networks is possible or not. And uh, the reason we're bringing this topic is that Alicia and I, we run a course called Thriving Networks. We've run it th three times now. Uh, it's a multi-week course with a bunch of different network leaders, people that are starting new networks um, in the process of maturing theirs. And uh, all of these networks usually have in common that they're somehow working on uh, impact and purpose in some way. But uh, one of the things that we really focus on in that course is all about topics around money, value, resources, uh, how to deal with conflict and tensions and all of these really difficult subjects that can often lead to these kind of groups actually falling apart when they run into them. And one of the persistent questions that comes up in that course is actually uh, how you can scale a healthy network. Because a lot of the things that we do in that course are actually about how to create strong bonds between the group and really mature the relationships and the group's capacity to, to hold these challenging questions. And so naturally, there, there's this question of how do we do that at a bigger scale? So we thought it would be interesting to bring that question in today and to invite, invite a bunch of alumni from our course to actually discuss this question, to dive into it and, and explore it from many sides. And I'm also quite excited that we have uh, a friend and colleague of mine, Rich Bartlett, joining us, who's also going to share from his experience uh, and a lot of great work he's been doing around this question of how to scale or how to, how to basically, uh, yeah, be a great network at a larger scale and has some interesting answers to that question. So uh, before we kick off in also some of our participatory dynamics and some inspiration that we're gonna hear, a uh, quick overview of the session today. So uh, after a brief check-in, we're gonna hear from Rich, who's gonna share with us some inspiration for 15 minutes, some food for thought for the session. After that, there's gonna be uh, 25 minutes of participatory breakouts where you're going to meet some people and get to connect. And after that, we're going to do a fishbowl uh, with the uh, participants of the Thriving Networks course, our alumni, that are going to dive into this question of scaling. And so you'll be able to observe and listen while they talk about their own experiences, what they've learned, what's been challenging. And after that, uh, we're going to have the so-called hazy ending, where also we're going to open up the fishbowl uh, more people will be able to jump in and ask questions and share reflections. So with that, um, this is sort of the introduction to the session. I'm going to kick us off and dive right in. Um, I'm excited to hand over to Rich, who I've known for quite a few years now through the Inspiral Network, because we're both fellow Inspiral members. And I think we probably met for the first time at We Share Fest, but um, Rich is originally from New Zealand, um, now living in Italy. And uh, I would say he came into all of this work through the Occupy movement, where he then uh, learned a lot about how to do decision making in groups and became the co-founder of a really great tool called Lumio that I must say, as someone working in networks for a long time, feels like something that is just an absolute must um, in terms of, yeah, key tools that will help you as a, as a network. And so um, since then, he's the founder of The Hum and uh, offers consultancy guidance facilitation for organizations and networks around organizing without managers. And uh, I can really recommend following him on various channels because he's an excellent writer and speaker. And um, there's a, a lot of really great things to read up and listen up on about Rich. Um, just putting that in the chat. Also a very active Twitter. Um, so yeah, I think with that, I'm going to pass to you, Rich, and yeah, let you kick it off with some food for thought about, I guess, probably micro-solidarity, 
um, which is a concept that I really think is super key when we think about the topic of scaling networks. Over to you. Thanks, Fran. Uh, it's good to be here. I feel like 15% nervous. Not sure why that is. Um, partly I'm looking right at my face now. Is there a way that I can not look at my face or is that just how it's going to be? I think it's very hard, unfortunately, if we okay. want to pin you. I'm sorry. Okay, great. Oh, actually, this I'll take this as a like shadow work practice where I just get to look at myself and beam compassion and acceptance. Hey, Rich. Um, yeah, I am... I think the nerves are maybe a little bit of seeing who's in the room and knowing that there are a bunch of people here with really deep experience. So I don't want to show up as a teacher uh, as if there's people that are completely a blank state looking at this. Um, so I guess what I want to share is my experience, my perspective, the lenses that I use when I'm thinking about networks and communities and groups and, and, and offer them you know, like in the same way I might offer my glasses, like put these on for a minute and see how the world looks. And yeah, see see how this, like, does it make things sharper or does it make things fuzzy? Is it useful to you? And, and put it in your toolkit if it's useful, rather than to say, this is the way things work. Um, I'm gonna do hopefully a reasonably short presentation, a little lightning talk just to get the conversation started. And then we go into breakout groups and you can pull it apart and put it back together and make your own sense of it. Okay, so sharing screen and thanks for the gallery view tips. I have no longer seeing my face. I get to see all your faces instead. Ah, much more relaxing. So I'm gonna talk about this thing called micro solidarity and it says a roadmap for high trust communities. So I know the topic is networks and there are so many different kinds of networks. I wanted to actually focus in on this thing called community because to me, a community is a particular kind of network. And, and like, Francesca mentioned the community that I have the most experience with is this thing called Inspiral. And it's a super high trust. Well, at least my experience of Inspiral has been a super high trust place. So it's like um, a network of between one and 200 people. It fluctuates. It's been around for, I think, 11 or 12 years now. And within that network, I have these relationships of, yeah, really extremely high trust. So like people that I can call up and say, hey, dude, I'm having a hard time. I need 5,000 euros to fix my car because it just exploded uh, and know that I'm going to get that kind of support or I can, um, yeah, that's a very practical thing, but also on the more like emotional or psychological front, like I know that I can get uh, solidarity and care. Someone's going to show up and care about my experience and, and at least provide a listening ear and some companionship, if not some good advice. It's also the place where I get to bring my creative ideas and find other people who are interested and, and receptive to my enthusiasm and potentially even available to, to join on as co-founders when I'm starting out a new project before it's even got any kind of business model or ideas about how the business, the money might work or anything like that. So it's been this amazing uh, location for my growth. I think of it as like, you know, I've got a, a houseplant just there and the houseplant is sitting inside a container and it's like, you need that container for the houseplant to grow. And for me, the, the community of Inspiral has been basically the place where I've done most of my growth and development. So it's 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 this real treasure for me. And the problem is it doesn't scale, okay? Like the, just the way that trust operates, uh, it works because there's less than a couple of hundred people. I, I, I can have meaningful, I can spend time, there's Jorium on the call here. I've had long and deep conversations with Jorium. We've had very ridiculous, hilarious conversations as well as really sad ones. Uh, and I can't do that with 10,000 people. You know, there's just not, it's just the, the social physics of it doesn't work out. And so that's where micro solidarity comes in. It's like, how, how could we support more people to have the experience of being in a very high trust community without all <laughs> inviting them all to join ours? Like, how can we give people a roadmap to build their own? So I'm going to introduce two pieces of theory that I use for thinking about network design, thinking about community design. And these have, yeah, these, I just keep coming back to these. It's sort of, it's almost like it doesn't matter what the challenge is. Like Fran mentioned decision-making, for example. Uh, usually I put on one of these lenses of scale or tempo and I find new insights. So I just keep returning back and back again to it. So I'll start with scale. So Imagine that this uh, this diagram of nested circles just keeps continuing out and out and out indefinitely. 
this I learned this basically from Robin Dunbar, who's an anthropologist, sociologist. People might know Dunbar's number in popular culture. That's this 150 is known as Dunbar's number. And uh, superficially, we treat that as like, that's about the number of people that you can have meaningful relationships with. There's a lot of nuance and, and sort of details behind that. But what I want you to think about instead of Dunbar's number is Dunbar's numbers, that it's plural. And so he he was basically saying, at each of these steps of scale from five people, 15 people, 50 people, on and on and on, that there's a distinct threshold that groups of different size behave like different organisms at these different scales. And the precise numbers are not important. You know, it could be seven, it could be four, maybe it's not 150, maybe it's 180, it doesn't really matter. But this idea that there are these steps, these orders of magnitude that continue 500, 1500, 5000, on and on and on. And if you look at like, Look at how armies are organized around the world or look at how patterns of traditional settlements and in indigenous communities like there's lots of um, uh, source data that says hey it looks like we group people together at these different scales and that those different scales are good for different things so there's things that you can do with five people that you just can't do with 50. like we're going to put you in breakout rooms breakout groups later because you can have a conversation with five people that you can't have with 500 obviously and vice versa versa there's like kinds of economics and um, efficiencies of transactions, efficiencies of scales that you can only do with a lot of people. You can't really have a thriving village with five or 15 people in it, it doesn't work. And this is a very kind of mundane insight, right? Groups of different sizes are good for different things. But I so often find community organizers and network designers kind of using the wrong scale for the job. When I'm working with organizations, sometimes with tens of thousands of people, the, one of the first questions is like, okay, you've, you've got this lovely culture of collaboration and trust and support and so on, but how does it scale? And my answer is always through great teams. Like you can't have a 20,000 person organization that is performing any better than any of its teams, right? Like the, the, the quality of the team relationships, that's where all the work's happening. That's where all of the decisions are being made is down at that team scale. Similarly, if you're organizing a conference, the quality of the relationships between the hosting team of that conference are going to broadcast a kind of emotional tone, you know, like, are they enthusiastic? Are they excited? Are they present? Are they available? Are they anxious? Are they uptight? Are they like kind of making you feel awkward the moment you step in the room? And those are relational qualities, right? It's not about me as an individual person, but me and my co-hosts and the and the the ways that we are relating to each other are going to broadcast it and have a have a real impact on what's happening on the rest of the room. Or another example, when you think about the most significant learning experiences of your life, there's some there's some moments of inspiration where you might be listening to a talk or you know you're watching something on YouTube and there might be a million people who have watched that video and you got some inspiration, but the real transformative learning moments usually happen at the micro scale. They're usually happening with a couple of people in the room where you really get to make a fresh connection or feel some kind of unburdening or like release. That's usually how it goes. And so uh, as you can hear from my bias here, I'm always drawing our attention down to the micro scale and making sure that any kind of network design, any kind of event design, organizational design is really tending to that small scale experience. Because it's at that small scale that you not just have not just the learning, but the, the sense of belonging, the sense of companionship, the sense of trust, all of that's happening at the micro scale. So this is the other lens that I use. Uh, for those musicians in the room, this is a very familiar diagram. If you're not a musician, forgive me if this is confusing to look at, but I'm just trying to show you that there's different tempos, different rhythms that are operating in any kind of organization and any in any kind of group of people. And it's uh maybe a little bit peculiar like a lot of if i asked you to draw your organization usually people draw like people and the connections between people or they draw groups of people you know there's the uh, this department and that department and or there's decision making or a hierarchy or a pyramid there's this kind of like spatial diagram when i draw an organization i start from the tempo that is like what are the periodic encounters that we have what is the what is the time that we come together? And it's like I, I see organizations as this pulsation between we go wide, we we diverge, we explore a million different ideas. There's like all of this autonomy and freedom. And then we converge and we come back and we form agreement and we have some kind of synchronization and getting people on the same page. And then we go out again. And it's this oscillation like this. And the oscillations happen at different frequencies. And 
I know this is a weird thing to say, but I really truly believe that collective identity grows from rhythmic encounters. So if I have a hobby and I do it occasionally, it doesn't form a significant part of my identity. But if I say I'm a footballer and I go to football practice every Tuesday evening and I play a game of football every Saturday, suddenly that becomes part of my identity. I become a footballer. You know, this, this once it becomes rhythmic, once it's like this dependable part of my calendar, it becomes part of my identity. And so that's one of the reasons I'm put, I put such emphasis on rhythmic encounters, like structuring events and opportunities for people to meet to each, meet each other that are not just ad hoc, they're not just this random chaos, but they're these dependable things that I know, ah, yeah, it's Monday afternoon, I do my Monday afternoon stuff. Again, it's like a, it's kind of a mundane insight, I think, but um, really essential to how a group starts to form its own sense of collective identity. I'm going to rapidly just name a few of the rhythms that we use to help you see how this lens applies in, in network design. So there's the relational rhythms, meaning the times that we come together primarily to tend to our relationships. It's not about doing stuff, it's about being together. It's about connecting and, 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 and communicating in that human way. So in a lot of the networks that I work in, we initiate a rhythm of weekly or bi-weekly peer support pods. And the idea with a pod is like, yeah, three, four, five people that you meet with on this, on this rhythm. And you might be doing a like online course together. You might be having um, a more unstructured peer support space where you just get to check in and talk about the challenges in your life and be there for each other. There might be um, different kinds of projects that are happening simultaneously through the network. And it's in these pods that you're like, have your moment of reflection on them. And then at the slower rhythm, we, in, in all of the thriving organizations that I'm uh, working with, we have retreats and usually annual or biannual that we have this opportunity to bring together people physically off this annoying Zoom thing and into, you know, the space where you can have a meal, you can dance, you can rub shoulders together. That, that, that's so essential for cultivating the depth of trust that we're going for. Another category of rhythms we use are planning rhythms. So this is more about objectives, right? This is more about strategy. This is more like how are we getting stuff done? Um, maybe every year we need to stop or every three years we need to stop and really have a big discussion about what's the overall direction, what's happening in the world, what's our position at that strategic level. And once every three months, we have a much more tactical, okay, what's going to be our top objectives. And so like that's where, like I said about the synchronization, that's happening there. This is where we're starting to form a coherent picture of the world. Then there's the working rhythms about actually getting stuff done. And um, some of you will be familiar with that agile management methodology. It's all about breaking big jobs down into small tasks and, and getting those tasks into a little package called a sprint. A lot of the teams I work in, we do two week sprints, but this is like, how can we get this sense of productivity and marking progress every week or every two weeks, every month, it's like we're getting somewhere. And then finally, and potentially most importantly, is the learning rhythm. So this is about, stopping whatever is your main work, your main activity, your main energy, and looking backwards, doing this retrospective gesture and saying, hey, looking back on that last month or whatever is the period here, what did we learn? Like what's, what's going really well that we should celebrate and lift up and say, let's do more of that. And what's not going so well? Where are things strained and tight? And when, when did I feel disengaged? Or when did I feel like we were wasting our time? And pull those lessons out and make sure that you, you can get into a process of continuous improvement. Because if you're doing the relational rhythms where people are developing open communication with each other and you're doing the learning rhythms where people are talking about what's not working and, and finding adjustments that they can make, then you get into the self-improving evolutionary cycle. That's where the, the network starts to kind of steer itself to wherever it needs to be. So to put that all together, uh, uh, the way that I think about like <laughs> how to get started, I know there's some people in the chat saying they're just getting started into this stuff. I always, I always focus on the small group first. So start with a small group. Don't start on your own. I really, um, I really don't want to give you this picture of that scale diagram, meaning you should start with yourself and become a tremendous collaborator and then go on to build a network. No, start with a small group, three, four or five people. And, and start to tune in relationships there that set the tone for what you want this wider network to be. And in my case, the networks I wanna be in are characterized by peer support, meaning 
there's not like a staunch hierarchy of someone who's like giving support to other people, but it's it's mutual. There's this like reciprocal bi-directional support. And when you're getting started, I find it really helpful to articulate a time-limited commitment. So instead of just, hey, I want to do this thing, I don't know what it's going to be or how long it's going to go, would you like to join me indefinitely? Having a time-limited commitment is a lot easier for people to say yes to. And say, for example, if we said we're going to meet six times over six weeks, at the end of that six-week period, you've got a way of saying, no, thank you. This is not really working for me. You know, there's a way to, to close gracefully without losing face. And the lack of this time-limited commitment is, is something that really drains energy out of new initiatives is that you get to this awkward point where it's like, oh, that group doesn't really quite have chemistry, but there's no graceful way to me to, for me to step out. So we just kind of like gradually fade out and then we feel awkward with each other. <laughs> so, so having that kind of bookended commitment really helps make it more graceful and more efficient in this like somewhat awkward process of trying to find the right, the right relationships. Like I said, it's really important to have the retrospective part. So like at the end of that six week period, you stop and you look back and you say, what did we learn? Do we want to keep going? Do we want to recruit more people? Do we want to try different structures, different practices? And once you have one group, one small group humming, then it's time to think about, are there three other groups that we can initiate? And then three more and three more and seven more and 15 more and 50 more, you know, that there's this gradual process starting from real life experience, starting from, we know this is working, we understand what's right for us. We've recruited more people and now they're starting to be some momentum. Then it, then it really does scale. Then it does reach many more thousands of people. So that's about as much as I wanted to share from a theoretical perspective. And um, I have this kind of sense of almost self-consciousness of like, I've just been like downloading. So I'm very curious to hear what happens when we take these ideas and, and translate them into your own context, break them apart, smush them back together. Thank you so much, Rich. Really great to hear that all sort of concisely together. So much knowledge and wisdom in there. So we're not going to have any questions now for Rich because Rich is also going to be part of one of the breakouts that we're going to have now. And also um, he is going to join part of the fishbowl later on. So hopefully you'll get more chances there to, to hear from him as well. But also, as I mentioned, there's a lot of ways to engage with Rich's work and to to find out more. So um, with that, I'm going to pass to Alicia now, who's going to take us through our breakout reflection exercise. Yes. Thank you, Fran. And thanks, Rich, for all that inspiration, which we're going to reflect now in the breakouts. So the first invitation is, uh, or question is to ask you if you want to join a breakout. Not everyone has to. You make the most of your experience here if you do. Uh, but yeah, it's not mandatory, of course. If you want to join a breakout, I would kindly ask you to put an X before your name, as it says in the chat, and how you do it. I'm just sharing the instructions also in the chat. Lower zoom bar, if you move your mouse, it appears. You click on participants, and then on the right side, you should have the list of participants. You're always the first one. Move your mouse, click on more, click on rename, and then put an X, I'm doing it myself as well now. Here we go, I have an X, meaning I want to go to the breakouts. If you want to know what you will be talking about in the breakout so that you can make up your mind, I'm going to walk you through that in just a moment. Here we go, it's going to be what we call a conversation cafe for which we will have 20 minutes and we will do three rounds. We will find yourself in a room with three other people. So we will be four in total. And you start just like, yeah, you can decide the order if you want, or just one person starts and then uh, calls the next one. First round is that each of you shares what you think, feel, or um, do regarding the topic that Rich has shared, this, these insights that he has given us. So it's like your reaction to what you have heard. Yeah, you do the full round, so all four of you share. And then the second round is that each of you shares the thoughts and feelings I mean, after having listened to all other your colleagues in the breakout that you will be in. Yeah, so it's like a, a resonances, reactions of what you have heard. And then the third round, you just share some takeaways. And you see an approximate time here is like one minute per person. If it's a minute and a few seconds, that's fine. We will still be on time, uh, but try to leave space for everyone. 
So those are the questions. Don't worry, you don't have to write them down. I'm going to share them in the chat so that you can have them at hand. Um, so yeah, just to repeat again, if you want to go to the breakouts, please put an X before your name. And now you have the instructions in the chat, first round, second round, and third round, so you don't get lost. And Fran is doing the breakouts. You're ready, Fran? Yeah, cool. Then I would say I wish you a great conversation and we'll see you back here in 20 minutes. Sorry, a few people just added their exes late, so I'm adding you to a room now. I don't seem to be able to stop the recording. Oh, I'm going to do that. Sorry. Okay, we're recording again now, and people are going to be coming back now. Yes. Okay, welcome back, everybody. How are those conversations? Good. Okay, I see some content faces. Very glad to hear that. So now for the third stage of our session, we're going to do our fishbowl. And so um, before Alicia explains how the format works, just a little bit of additional framing for the topic. Of course, we're just continuing the conversation that you've just been having. And uh, the people that are going to be in the fishbowl are, for the start, going to be various different alumni from our Thriving Networks course from different uh, cohorts. So they might not all know each other. So that's also going to be interesting to see what exchanges might happen there. And so just to sort of uh, get you started and get things framed, um, we have some guiding questions that can be useful. But of course, it's always just an invitation to help the thinking. And so those questions are, how has the topic of scaling showed up specifically in your network? And what has your experience been? So maybe good experiences, uh, bad experiences, um, you know, experiments that you've tried, things that have worked or not worked. And maybe is there something that on this journey of, of being in this network, um, you, you've actually changed your mind about? Because I think uh, if, I, if I think back to our last cohort, I think that even within that course, there were some people that came in with certain ideas about how they thought they might scale their network that had been changed quite a lot after those eight weeks. So I think it's always especially interesting to think about what is something that maybe you've evolved in terms of your opinion um, and that you maybe now see differently and why is that? So with that, um, Alicia is gonna explain to us now how exactly it's gonna work so that we can dive into the bowl. Thank you, Fran. So yes, fishbowl format. I guess some of you are very familiar with it. Maybe others have not um, had this experience online yet. I see some thumbs up. Can I see who has been in a fishbowl before? Like thumbs up or reaction? Let me see. Almost everyone. Okay, so I'll do this, uh, this lightly. I know the fish, so the people having the conversation and the rest of us are having like uh, looking and listening at them. And how we're going to do this online will be with cameras on and off. So we will find a way in which through having your our camera on, this means we want to talk and engage in the conversation. And then when we switch it off, it's like we step out of the fishbowl. So that's our way of stepping in and out. Camera on, in, camera off, out. And we will start with these uh, six people. I'll just say your names so that you remember that you say yes, that you were up for the discussion. So that's going to be Brigitte, Guy, uh, Amir, Nenat, Friederike, Yannick, and Bianca. So I will invite those of you that I named to leave your camera on or turn it on. And the rest of us are going to turn it off. And then I need everyone all, also those of you who have it on to follow these um, two steps that I will be sharing my screen on for now so that you have a nice fishbowl experience. So once, once I stop sharing, you can go there into gallery view and then you look for your name or actually someone else's even uh, with the camera off, someone with the camera off, then you move the mouth, the mouse, you see the three little dots, click on them and then 
you will see this option appearing, hide non-video participants. And like this, you will only see the people that have the camera on. And that's how we will flow all together in the conversation. So I'll stop sharing now, and then you can go and do it. View, gallery view. You have a look at the three little dots on someone who has the camera off, and then you click hide non-video participants. Now I see uh, seven, let's say Guy James. I would invite you to turn the camera off. Uh, not Guy Amir, Guy Amir. Exactly, here we go. So these are the six of you who are going to have the conversation. It's six of you now. I will invite though a fishbowl of three people. This means that three of you will start and we will do this. Yeah, let's see who of you wants to stay or who wants to wait a little more. And you will have, um, let's say this discussion during about 20 minutes. Yeah, during 20 minutes more or less, it's going to be uh, the six of you just discussing, as asking questions, make it a discussion, right? So don't pop a question and disappear. Yeah, and when you see you are done, then you turn the camera off, two people will be left. This is an invitation for someone else to jump in. Yeah, so that's how we flow. If you see there's no one in the fishbowl, then uh, try to fill it up with uh, one or two of you. And if you see it's four already, the invitation for someone to, to step down. So this is uh, the framing. We'll let it flow and see how it goes. And if um, you need any format support, I'm here for that. The questions, you have them in the chat. So now it's the invitation. Who wants to stay for the first round? Okay. Oh. Someone else come back, Bianca, come back. Okay. It was you who turned it up. And then we get started. Let's go. So should I come back or should I stay? Because I'm <laughs> on my phone, so I can't see all the screens. You're good, you're good. You have the camera on. So it would mm -hmm. be for you, Nenat and Frelike to how has the topic of scaling showed up in your network? What has your journey been? And what has changed your mind about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I can start. I was I was remembering a, a specific slide that I saw at the course that was uh, showing um, difference between hierarchy, community, and uh, network. And um, I realized that uh, whatever dynamics was happening for me and my networks, I'm part of several networks was actually on this axis of uh, differences between community and network. And uh, I would, I could share the screen, but uh, I can also read the characteristics and uh, maybe it would be interesting to talk a little bit about it. So under community, what is listed is belonging, identity, love, equality, consensus, something like that. And under network, what is listed, common interest, uh, task-oriented. Actually, it's written no task, no connection, which I find to be true, and commitment for the task. So whatever I experienced uh, since the course, which was, I think, beginning of 2020, uh, it was somewhere on, on this space changes happening between network and community elements. Mm -hmm. Frederick, do you want to go next? Sure. I agree with that. Um, the, the two networks that I'm most involved in are, um, are like, one is more a community of practitioners, <laughs> where that definition falls into. Um, of dragon dreaming practitioners, where it's like it's a huge amount of people worldwide, and the only thing that is common is basically the dragon dreaming website. Um, but everything else is organized locally, and and I wouldn't say that there's a global network because there's no common tasks. Like, yeah, we're a couple of people who now maintain the website, um, the international website, but everything else um, is just yeah belonging to the methodology, belonging to the philosophy behind it. And the other part is um, uh, within um, Wandelbündnis, which is um, Coalition for Change, is a nonprofit, and it's kind of a, 
um, a, a platform organization for for initiatives who don't have a um, legal entity who are not a legal entity to enter that platform and use the legal entity of the um, yeah of the nonprofit for a bank account for legal reasons and etc. And there it's really like some come and and um, are just interested in like having a bank account and um, but then we also need to build trust. So that's where the scaling comes up. Like in the past few years, we basically were building up just the the core of the organization to be able to to actually deliver <laughs> on that on that um, commitment of saying like, hey, here you can have a bank account and you are part of a nonprofit and you are eligible to um, for for tax. How do you say that tax reduce eligibility I don't know <laughs> English <laughs> but, and it's it's um, uh, it it takes quite a while that's um, that's a difficulty I see there yeah kind of scaling up the network like a small part of like a handful of people like maybe five are constantly active and are actually doing the whole thing. And then there's uh, this, this whole network of, I don't know who is there, <laughs> who, who sometimes pops in and, and uh, is then invisible again. So. Yeah, I, I found it quite interesting to hear, to listen to like, um, I, I guess I would say your different types of networks and also different types of experiences. Um, Personally, I was just reflecting on like, so I'm in China and the last two years um, since I left my corporate job, I would say I've been very um, highly engaged and involved in two networks, both of them around shared purposes. And, um, and supposedly both of them, I would say are like, we're formed with the intention to build these new types of um, purpose um, networks purpose aligned networks where people can actually build high trust and bring their wholeness to work and all that stuff and yet in reality i saw in both of these networks that um like the knowing doing gap right so you can have these good intentions but there is like so much i would say um habitual patterns of uh thinking but also behaving that seems to magically pull people into being more um, like dragged into and the excitement of co-creating that then people end up tend to neglect how important the relational space actually is for the long term, right? And um, and I was as I was saying in our smaller group earlier, I realized the problem with it for the long term is that you always have that iffy feeling that it's like the soul of the organization is lacking. Like there's a lot of excitement and activities, but there's just something that's lacking that's making the activity not as nurturing as you know as it could be if you were fully aligned with your purpose and if you could actually bring your whole self to work. And for me, like I've switched networks since I took part um, for the in the 2021 Thriving Networks class. And now I'm part of a network that is more aligned when it comes to being more human centric. But the challenge that I noticed here is um, like where we actually started out with eight people and I'm super curious about other people's experiences, but this is a number that can be slightly challenging, especially with the pandemic. We've been working a lot online and lately I, I realized what we've been lacking is actually just like an offline human to human kind of retreat experience where we actually align more deeply on our purpose, but also our organiza organizational strategy. And I guess as a last thought, what has changed for me big, like very fundamentally is my identity um, about being part of a network. I like just the last two months, I finally realized that um, like no matter how many networks you're involved in, you always need to be the source of your own life. And, um, and that's with that clarity of a vision of your life, you have clear priorities and then you can actually clear boundaries. And that actually leads to true sovereignty in a network. So that would be my last point. 
Oh. Can I share what what uh, I changed my mind about, and then I can read <laughs> sure, the yeah. for somebody. So I, I tended to see networks as collection of individuals. And actually, what is more and more clear to me is that uh, that's not really useful uh, perspective. Um, because uh, trust and tasks and work is done in teams. Actually, I think it's much more useful to look at networks as collection of teams. Mm -hmm. And people can come in and out of teams and people can pop in and out individually, but basically uh, looking at network as a collection of teams is more useful for facilitating interactions. Mm -hmm. So that's well, it for me. Mm -hmm. I guess we just all close our screens, right? <laughs> Um, or you can stay in the conversation, that's fine. Yeah, you don't have to run away. <laughs> uh, yeah, hearing the three of you, what came to mind is like the, like when we're small, right? It's like, maybe it's easier for new people to join because we are there. It's easier to orient. Or maybe if you're a source of the network, then you're like, it's the easiest because you know what you want. It's easiest. And some terms, I know from the you know from the context perspective of what is happening and what is needed, because you are the source, or maybe you are from the founding team. But just thinking of uh, yeah, I'm thinking of join when when I join a new network, which already is you know I don't know has its own history, has its own size, it has its own context. So about that process of the of onboarding, because like. Frederica, you said, right, you're, you're like five people like doing the job and all, all the other people like are just observing, I don't know, in some cases, some people call them leechers. They're just waiting and popping in, popping out. And, and I'm just thinking of myself if I was, if I wanted to get in. So what is needed so I can feel like, uh, yeah, welcomed. And if there's a lot of work for people in the inner circle to welcome me, and what kind of onboarding process and personal uh, relationship that I need to build just to, yeah, to feel belong, to feel like in, and feel like with uh, enough context. So like, and uh, as you scale, that becomes much more complex and much more complicated. Like to understand what's happening. And I, right, you don't have to understand, no, every everybody, but uh, yeah. So that's my thoughts when I was hearing you, three of you, like on the onboarding process as you scale up. And not saying that you need to scale up, but uh, but when it's in a, I don't know, you get to a size where it's uh, it's more complicated for new people to understand what's happening and for them like to be fully committed in. So. Um, I think. Yeah. I will, I will share what I still have is on my mind and then I will also leave the stage for somebody else. Um, so yeah, this topic of, of scaling and, and, and what you mentioned again, uh, Guy, um, about we are five people and then around there are people who sometimes pop in and, and pop out and but the commitment is not there. Um, it's, it's also about looking at our capacity like how much capacity do we have to actually do proper onboarding and um, well, I participated with you in, in the Darwin Networks course starting that started this February this year. So um, ever since then, which is not a long time, um, I've, I've changed in terms of thinking of like, oh, we have to do that all together. I've just started to like experiment around like what could onboarding look like. So I've been in contact with people who were interested in joining the network. So I did like one onboarding and then a second one. And now um, I see what works well, what, what is not working well, what, what is actually missing in terms of onboarding or where do f people feel scared like in joining one of, the, um, one of the working groups. So now I can take that knowledge and, and pass it on into a micro solidarity group <laughs> of like onboarding um, and then see like how we can pass that on. But it takes time and and especially if we do that on a voluntary basis, like I really do look at how much capacity I have and then I don't go over it. And then it just goes slowly. 
can, can you share a bit of an insight or a, I don't know a nugget of the from your from experience of what what works well and what from the onboarding yeah yeah well um one thing that works well is is the personal level like people who actually had a personal contact in that case me one person one one woman he she tried to like become part of the network already but the people that she she talked to was weren't the ones that she felt comfortable with and and in on some occasion we met each other and said yeah well actually what you want to do you can do in Vanderbundness and uh, she said yeah but I tried to join but I don't really get like get into it and apparently I was the right person to to um, lead her through the process so like the personal level and then of course the trust that that uh, that person has and had I think you need to find the right match or like a universal <laughs> I don't know, onboarding person that's just really good with everyone. I don't know if that exists, but <laughs> yeah, kind of like that. So thank Thanks. you. I will leave the stage now. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> yeah, I want to build on this, this, this idea of onboarding, lots of different um, layers of um, networks. And um where i'm mostly working in so we are a network at the core we are a social enterprise um so um there's a bit more commitment at the core just in terms of time time payment and so on and i was just thinking like who is actually part of our network and this is something i think that changed for me also after the course because it's not that trivial right and to, to give one example i mean um our tax consultants are they part of our network in a way they are and it's because um when they don't respond to emails internally we can do all the things in a certain way but somehow they are having an influence on our logic as a network internally so somehow they are part of it so should we do an onboarding with them right but what we just talked about like we do with core members and somehow yes even with customers right just because they they give us money doesn't mean that they can do anything because then they can somehow interfere in our logic so and i think this is something that we are more and more consciously um working with like who are all all those uh ignored institutions and people that somehow are part but yeah you know how and just to mention it uh, which is building on a on source it was mentioned i think, I think twice um i think has been really really critical something that we implemented and i think with that comes a question that guides me and us for months which is about sovereignty and shadow work right especially when we decentralize also ownership and so on somehow uh, we transfer lots of ownership responsibility within the individual and yes they can show up with their whole selves but that does not free us from the responsibility of doing the inner work but how do you foster that in the system so that's a, a living question i would call it so so in in a context of of, of scaling like in this, uh, I know, source work, shadow work, interpersonal, like personal work. And uh, yeah, so I, I've been thinking in the context of scaling, um, yeah, what should we like uh, consider when we talk about uh, scaling this up with all this, like it's all like inner work or relationship work. So, so how would you two like uh, think what should we, I don't know. What is the difference when it's a small network and it's a big network in that, like in that context? I think, I, so I run a DAO um, uh, and it's quite a small group and we have scaled a bit very intentionally um and i always feel like we're near death you know because everybody does it on the side kind of thing but we seem to still keep going and every time we almost die uh or you know it's been like two or three times there seems to be this kind of renewed enthusiasm so there is a kind of like underlying desire uh or alignment about a kind of potential long-term vision but the short-term cost to everybody of uh doing what needs to be done collectively is a little bit higher than um you know the willingness from the group let's say that um and i always feel because i 
kind of initiated the whole thing um that it's my fault you know I take it in a way I, I observe it as being like I take it quite personally this idea that it might fail and uh in terms of people just not wanting to engage with it but I, I also um, realise that I can't make it be successful because it's really not dependent on me. Um, and But I struggle with that all the time. I kind of observe that as a constant and ongoing tension. Um, and I, so I think for me, there's this kind of energy around it, which is like, is there's the short-term vision and the long-term vision, which is important. Like, it, it, how much do I get as an immediate payoff of being part of this network? If I invest my time, how much do I get out of that? And then there's like, to what extent am I invested in the long-term vision of what this might be? And both of those things are kind of like motivating forces. And if the short-term one is very poor, very weak, then the long-term one has to compensate in some kind of way. Like there needs to be this grand vision for people to continue to put their time in. Um, and uh, I think on ours, our vision is kind of quite moderately exciting, I would say. Um, and it's also, and it kind of varies in terms of like the short term payoff thing. But I think it is like an energy because people, for things to keep going, the energy has to build for things to grow. It's not like you don't, I think, grow the network by adding people, you grow the network by creating more value that kind of draws people in. You have that ability, it's an organism basically. And um, uh, yeah, and people have to keep willing, be willing to put it in. I also sort of think about it as a party. Like if you wanna have a party, you, you have to invite like two, three people. You have to have that kind of spark. And then people want to come in at some point and they bring the best of themselves and they start giving. And of course, like eventually everybody gets tired, but if you're kind of amassing, people and energy and interest and enthusiasm at the right rate then it keeps building and um, but it's okay it doesn't have to be a festival you know it can be like a small intimate really great dinner party I'm not so so like obsessed with the idea of scaling because I I also am very interested in longevity and I think that there is a bit of a tension there um, but yeah for me I, that's how I think about what works do I want do I want to grow more or not or what's the next thing to do is what brings more energy into this what incites people to give more of themselves uh, to this group and for us right now is a bit more of a social cadence so we have a call now every two weeks and we're globally distributed so I do one at like eight in the morning and one at seven at night okay time um, and I think just kind of having that cadence is going to help and it's quite social but also intellectual so everybody gets a little bit out of it and there is a bit more of a regular check-in um, I don't know I'm kind of talking quite a lot but I think it's difficult I, I certainly don't feel like I have any kind of universal theory of anything about how to do this because my experience feels very limited um, and also I just try and imagine what everybody else's perspective in it and I'm just kind of one participant but I this is what I observe I observe it in in that way and I found from the course um, that the source work was incredibly valuable for understanding my role in the network as the person who created it. So I noticed that in willing it to be distributed, I was often the kind of stepping away and just hoping that somebody else would step into it. And I now understand um, that part of enabling everybody else is kind of being that, but what, what the role of source or however, I know that not everybody is, that excited about it as a concept but certainly for me as a kind of leadership learning of a distributed network I found um, that, that the framework was really helpful. Yeah thank you and I just want to add one one part and then I'll also leave that circle here uh, but it's something I'm currently thinking quite quite a bit about um, which is about scaling and um, mounting is and of course the question like what do you actually scale right and of course there services and so on and currently i'm reading up um, or shared it also in the chat above on the um, what's called building blocks thesis where you actually scale small blocks of value that you create as a network and actually what you mainly scale is the process of how to create and assemble and deliver these kinds of blocks which i find really interesting because of that you're both scaling out and at the same time you're also scaling deep because you are including the relational component in the, the scaling so if somebody's interested in Definitely. I mean, this is something I'm currently diving into, also thinking what kind of business models could be attached to that. Yeah, I'd love to 
I love it if you share that or if it's, uh, yeah, contact me. I love that. Uh, yeah, I'm having like a the house uh, noise, so I'm I'm gonna. I have a lot more questions, but I'll just also turn off my uh, video right now. Maybe join later. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you all that participated so far. This would be the moment in which we would open the floor to everyone, anyone present to jump in. So yeah, Felica, you can stay. Let's see who joins us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> let's see who turns the camera on. And it can also be, of course, the, the ones that just participated. You can continue the conversation. But if anyone else also wants to jump in, please feel invited. Just turn the camera on. We'd love to hear from you. Um, what maybe? Ah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, because I felt like we did this six and three and threes, and there are actually still quite a lot of insights that I'm holding on to that I feel like maybe I could uh, put in here, and then like definitely would love to hear more from the larger group. So one of the things that I was thinking about just even in the beginning when I think it was. I actually forgot his name. Um, the guy in our trio um, was talking about like belonging and um, other contexts. Like one of the things I keep coming back to is um, like, I really do, uh, yeah, Nina, it was your name, yeah. Um, I keep coming back to, um, at, the, at the root of it, I really do still think that whether you call it scaling or like, um, growing deep or horizontally it really does come down to like um value distribution because if i think about it like in my current network um i'm definitely someone who's very passionate about building relational spaces and um but one of the the reasons it, it doesn't seem to be sustainable is that when the network is small it's it's like driven more by individuals and if you want it to be larger then probably you need to have like these more we're kind of echoing the word where every, not everyone leads all of, all of the time, but some people lead some of the time. Along those lines, you need more circular leadership. But for that to happen, you actually need more balance of give and take and flow, like especially for people who are contributing to trust that if they contribute more, that there will eventually be a flow um, that, that comes back so that it can move into resonance. And without that, people, Mm, there's only so much that can happen in the long run just by passion alone and I feel like there's a, such a deep piece of trust that is about knowing are we aligned in what we believe to be valuable and can we co-create balanced relationships in a network so just wanted to add that yeah yeah thank you so much um what made me come back in here into the fishbowl was also the the question like what are we actually scaling and um, what was really helpful and eye opener for me throughout for within the thriving networks course was to look at our um, value flow what is actually value that we are giving as a network what is our purpose as a network and um, who is benefiting from our from our value so when you're a platform that gives um, that supports initiatives um, for now in germany but actually it's possible worldwide uh, to to like do something that has to do with positive change um, and for them to have it easier to just do the work that they want to do and not and not worry about like what do I have in terms of taxes what do I how do I how do we get a common bank account how do we manage all of that um, so that's that was a huge eye-opener that this is our value that we are giving and that also the people who are involved in the core and and in in the, in the near circle <laughs> they need to know about that so that they can actually communicate that to the people so so in terms of scaling it's like we need to provide like how do we provide it we are using now open collective to provide the money flow part also in, in terms of um, transparency so that's scaling on that part um, to deliver the, the the value of you can use our bank account and our nonprofit um, and on the other part is like scaling in terms of people like um, we, I think we cannot stay five people, not for now, if maybe if we <laughs> become more efficient, efficient in the processes, we may, but, but for the moment, I would like to see us scale also in terms of people, maybe become 20 or 30 people within the core of the organization who are maintaining the commons. So.
I thought of uh, coming in on the question of what are we actually scaling? <clears throat> and um, well, it depends what what kind of networks we're talking about. My focus is on transformative networks like global eco-village movement, transition network, you know, networks we're really trying to accelerate transformative social change. And the lens with that is that we're trying to scale social impact. We're trying to scale new models of relating, of behaving you with know, social practices, right? Like for instance, model you want to scale kind of spreading that model and more and more people adopting the model. But even beyond that, um scaling kind of relationships and ways of thinking, the ways of behaving. The sort of regenerative agricultural practices, the social technologies of trust building and groups um, that can go beyond eco villages as well, right? So, how can the models and the solutions, the ways of being that are prototyped within eco villages spread also in the wider social field? Um, so, that's kind of widening in terms of scaling the relationships and behaviors and less about scaling organizations or just the models in which those ways of being and relating are embedded. That's really interesting, Tim. I'm glad you brought those examples because um, I was also thinking about this question, what are we scaling? And and you're describing, I think, more like the output, so like the impact uh, that's rippling out from this work. And I was thinking more about what's happening inside the network. So it's like scaling connection, scaling friendship, scaling courage, scaling inspiration uh connectedness that sort of stuff um and actually it's interesting to compare those two things because i think the balance can can swing too far one way or the other like if all your style is external impact which a lot of it's especially like younger people are really super mobilized around we need to change the world you know there's this like real focused on on our, how we need transformative systems change um, that it's really hard to get people to pay attention to the internal dynamics and the and the need for building trust because it's like, oh, we haven't got time to talk about our feelings. We've got to go and save the planet or save the polar bears or something. Um, but then conversely, if there's like too much in, internal, I think it was Nanad was saying, or maybe it was in a breakout, I forget, but that that if you don't have, if you don't have, if you don't have things to do, if you don't have tasks, if you're just like, oh, we just connect. You know, the, the connection doesn't really form. It doesn't really go anywhere. It's like this kind of um, stagnant water. It's like there needs to be flow. There needs to be some external focus. But like I say, it needs to be in balance somehow. Um, I just wanted to add my two cents about what are we scaling? Um, it's a question that excites me a lot. And I've had some, you could say, some breakthrough insights around this just recently. And, um, and I realized for me lately, um it's actually it's about two things like one is it is it is actually about scaling um in the in, like you were mentioning about global ecohood and beyond right and i think a lot of us are now part of these purpose networks that are about positive social impact but if you really think about positive social impact it's about really making um making people's lives better, making this world more beautiful, more, more livable. And it's about scaling values. Like lately I realized it's about scaling values and scaling to me very much. It's also about scaling. Um, um, I was very profoundly touched by a body of work called Value Science lately that talks about how there's intrinsic value then there's extrinsic like social value and then there is systemic value and intrinsic value is at actually that level that's about depth and your being and your spirituality actually and i was realizing that in many ways maybe what we are trying really to scale is these values and ways of life how we treat ourselves each other and also the planet and so so like if you will it's also about scaling consciousness <laughs> and and it's something that is very fuzzy right and subtle but like the reason i say this it's for me it's very practical because i see this like um huge irony and dichotomy even in the in these purpose-driven networks if the source is not actually doing their inner work and shadow work to really prioritize like self-care and self-love and really treating him or herself like lovingly compassionately and humanly and what often happens is that before we have these healthy structures, that shadow impacts the entire network. Like in my current source, 
the way it reflects is that they, the source is much more customer focused and then ends up still treating the maybe the network members eventually a little bit more like tools than human beings. And that's not from an intention place. It's because we treat other people how we treat ourselves. And so I started thinking lately that what we're really trying to scale is a kind of consciousness that can us and each other and the plant with compassion and respect and the corresponding structures and culture maybe. So this is my best attempt at answering this question. Bianca, I'm really curious then, how do you distinguish, because I basically agree with what you're saying, but the puzzle in my head is like, what's the difference between scaling values and colonization, you know, because like the whole, the whole justification for colonization was like, oh, we're going to these undeveloped places and we're bringing civilization, we're bringing a much more enlightened perspective, we're going to bring democracy, progress, da da da, da. like, yeah. how do we know we're doing something different than that? Totally hear you. And I have a very simple answer that's coming from my heart, like right now. There's a big difference because scaling values is much more about embodying being the change. It's not about like trying to give something or trying to push something. It, like lately, I've been giving a lot of about this level of being. So it's not actually, it looks like you're doing something, but it's actually more about you being it. And so you don't push it onto someone else. Colonization means that you're very sure like what you have is better and you need to give it to others because but other people are inferior, right? For me, it's about like, it's like Buddhistic concepts, like the, the journey is the destination. So it's actually about like embodiment and um, rather than colonization. And it's about really attuning to your like essence and and it's not actually about doing. The doing is coming from the being and it looks like you're doing something. This is a very like difficult topic to verbalize, but I think that is my attempt to answer that, that question. <laughs> so it's not colonization, it's all about, about being it. So you need to become that example, right? And yeah. Yeah, I like that word scaling by meditation. Thank you. Thank you all. Just wanted to invite if anyone else wants to jump in before we close the fishbowl itself. Let's see. I didn't want to kick you out, guys. <laughs> if you wanted to stay, that's perfectly fine. Let's see if anyone else wants to add anything. We have a very lively chat. Okay, yeah, Gio, I go for it. I, I was not ready to be on video, but I actually wanted to invite. Hi, Victoria. Hi. Um, I haven't heard, uh, you know, the power, the dynamics of power in the conversations yet and not acknowledging that there is power and um, understanding to, I wouldn't say fine tune, but like tune that power in a way that it serves everybody in the conversation is yeah something i'm interested in victoria what 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 were you thinking <clears throat> you know i just love the conversation uh, everything that i'm involved with all the networks and it could absolutely gain so much from this conversation i um, i hope this is being recorded and we can get a copy of it because i came in a few minutes late and i realized i actually missed some really <laughs> things so is this going to be available yes 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 it is Oh, that's wonderful. And I'm going to put my contact information in in the chat. And I, I see there's like a lot of chat stuff I haven't looked at at all. I'm going to save the chat. And I suggest if people love this, they ought to save the chat. Um, do you save the chat as well, people? Yeah, uh, we will. Um, Victoria, is there any point or question you would have on this topic before we close it? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I love what Bianca was saying about the being versus doing, and I just don't know where to take that, but I think that's absolutely what's at the core, and so I'll be looking into that, and Bianca, if you, if you can put your, your contact information in there, I'd love to hear more about that. I can respond a little on the, on the PowerPoint. Um, and it sort of fits in there was that question about what's changed for you in this work and I think what's changed for me is I started uh, like Fran mentioned from Occupy so there was like explicitly leaderless explicitly non-hierarchical 
and in the last uh, 11 years, my relationship with hierarchy has gotten more complex and, and my relationship with leadership is more complex now. And like, I'm looking for ways that like, what are like healthy models of a kind of hierarchy that I can actually see myself in. And the closest I've got is hospitality. You know, that, that when I invite you into my, into my home, there is a power dynamic, it's my place, but my orientation is towards your needs and your sense of welcome and, and your sense of belonging. And if the relationship goes well, you will settle in and then I can say, make yourself at home, meaning the power difference between us has now basically been equalized and, and we kind of share responsibility for the space and for each other. Um, and ideally, you will invite me to your house you know that it's not like you've just moved into my to my guest room but that we have this exchange that people can take turns and so like that's the model that I've got in my head where I'm like okay there's a there's obviously a hierarchy there of kind there's a kind of leadership there there's a kind of power dynamic there but it feels very oriented towards care and and and, and welcome and safety and so on whereas most other images of hierarchy yeah it's just the power dynamic of coercion that's the main that's the main flavor I have. And so that's my way of like kind of making peace with the fact like as, as someone who's initiating a community, I've got a lot more power than people. And so I need like role models for how to, how to exercise that power in a way that's life-giving. That's kind of like my best guess for now. Yeah, I wanted to chime in my own idea of how I would like to invite power. Um, and, and the simple thing that I say to myself is giving myself the permission to embrace the uh, effect that I'm gonna bring in or the impact or who I am energetically and otherwise. And inviting others to be fully themselves too, embracing what they bring in as their power to influence. It's, it touches what you're saying, but um, <clears throat> I know um, the lot of human trauma comes from this whole people pleasing, the boundaries not, and uh, the whole idea of hospitality and, uh, you know, invite me again. Like I, I try and stay away. I'm like, I'm gonna step into my powerfully, consciously, intentionally, knowing that I have all these flaws. Like I showed up on this video without like, I was not gonna be on video and like that, right? But giving myself the permission to be fully myself gives an invitation for others to be fully themselves. And I, that, I don't want to neutralize power. If we neutralize power, then, you know, it rises subconsciously. One thought, it, like, I don't want to neutralize power. I don't want peer. I want us, I mean, I want to embrace ourselves as powerful beings and take ownership of that power as we give power to others, right? So that's my take on it. Thank you. Such a privilege to be in this conversation. I, um, good to see you, Joe. Uh, I, um, am, I hope I can articulate this well. There's, there's for me a couple different things. I loved that Richard, you provided a certain vocabulary let's call it organic structure of the individual, the pair, the larger group team and, and such. And there, there is a fractal, I, I believe, that describes and that at different levels of the fractal, the same principles may apply, but, but what applies is actually a different thing. And so to use the example of learning, when I learn as an individual, it's all happening within my brain and, and I kind of regulate all that learning presumably, and pick up the signals from the, from, from the universe. When I do it as a, as a couple or as a team or as a, it's a different learning system. So a hive, the, the, the thing to regulate in a hive is the signals that the bees are giving between them. And their learning is distributed in a completely different way. And so we can be using the same vocabulary about learning when we're really ref referring to very different kinds of things. And so, um, and so that's kind of one of the recurring traps that I find I get into um, when, when having conversations about being a participant in the living system. It's like, wait, am I talking at the level of the me, at the level of the, 
the we small we big we you know whatever and um and then the thing that i'll i'll try to articulate that that um i know i can't because i've just been i've had my mind blown open recently by it i don't yet understand it but i feel it resonates with the truth of the universe has been this work about adaptive learning as a as a as a learning fractal uh, as a that 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 learning occurs there's a relationship between an inside a membrane of, of of filtering shall we say and then an outside and um and that uh how the inside evolves in response to the signals that it's getting is part of what there is to attend to and so the way that i might have uh um described the question of what are we scaling is is that um attention to the to to building mutualism with the external whatever that is <clears throat> um and i'll just stop there thank you thank you thank you everyone thank you all for having participated also in the chat some of you were super active so this will be the moment to turn our cameras back on since now we're also in a size that we can see each other on gallery so make sure you're in gallery view upper right corner of zoom view gallery view and we're now into our more like um hazy ending but before that i just wanted to invite you to briefly share in the chat something that you have taken uh for yourself from this very rich fishbowl that we have experienced It'd be great to have a little takeaway from each of you so just take a moment and once re you're ready just write it and press enter that's fine And once you have written, just go through. See some of the takeaways in the room. Cool. And while you keep pouring all that, all those takeaways in, we just wanted to invite you now for the next, uh, let's say, max uh, 15 minutes that we have. We have Rich here, and uh, we would just invite you to ask him any questions you might have on the topic. Uh, but you can also ask each other questions that I have heard something that you said in Fishbowl and I want to know more, uh, etc. So we can see what questions do you have, what came up, what do we want to engage in this final hazy ending part. Up to you. Yeah, and I'm also just going to add before anyone drops off, if you haven't joined the course yet and you are interested, we are uh, filling up our next cohort for October 5th. And um, we've had a lot of people joining groups, like multiple people from their network. And I think that's been quite enriching to have other people to think about the content together with. So just uh, putting that out there in case you're interested. Can you put the, um, the URL in the chat? For the course? I, I did already. You oh, just need great. to scroll up because three more people just posted. But you'll also receive an email afterwards with the recording and also we're, we're making sure to get everything from the chat. All the, all the snippets will be in a document. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll jump in with a question to Rich. Um, so like I was intrigued after thinking that, I don't know, three, four slides that you showed and thinking about how does it start? Then actually the question for me is when, when it gets to a, big, to a big scale and and I'm putting aside the question, if we need to get to a big scale and what does that, like why? But let's say we get to a big scale. So does, do you see like uh, patterns like emerging there? Because if you have like, a thousand groups of five people, like 
what what does that look like what, is there like an, another layer to this or is this something else so thinking about like when it gets big and bigger just thinking about it i i'm not again i'm not saying that we should get there to maybe i don't know mm -hmm. networks of 300 and then you duplicate them or not duplicate mm -hmm. you know like in spiral it's just a, it's open source take whatever and do your own thing but if we actually think of of a big scale how does that look like and is there something in thousands yeah good question um so i was part of the occupy movement which basically was a lucky kind of random gesture of a few activists like activists are always making these gestures and very occasionally something sparks um you know the right memes the right posters the right tweets the right videos got produced and seen at the right time it was kind of random emergence not entirely random but unpredictable uh and for the first few weeks it was like the number of occupy uh camps and interventions and moments of you know coming alive the number of the camps were growing by like 20 percent uh per day and the size of each camp was growing 20 percent per day so there's this like incredible like massive scale um every continent on the planet and within each camp and i only figured this out afterwards because in the in the in the day-to-day -day of it we were just caught up with our local reality but afterwards you could actually read through documentation and blogs and people's experience of what it was like in the camp and there was a very it was like every camp was going through the same experience step by step almost like oh day five these are the kind of day five challenges you're likely to hit day 10 day 50 you know um and we didn't have the infrastructure for coordinating learning very effectively. There's a little bit, but not much. And you watch as one group after another succumb to the same failure modes. And basically, I see the failure mode as insufficient hosting capacity, like insufficient facilitation skill. Uh, one of the reasons that I married my partner, Nati, I met her at Occupy was because she had this ability to hold the group in the most unbelievable divergence to the extent of like um, people having psychotic ex episodes, people being physically violent, uh, people, you know, like in another reality. And still she had the, the presence and compassion and, and patience to, to stay with people and to model like, okay, if we want to do inclusion, this is what it looks like. This is what people are like. And most people don't have that capacity. Most people can't hold their hearts open uh, for that degree of diversity. And that's just one example, you know, that's like a, a more almost like spiritual example, but there's a lot of practical stuff about project management, decision-making, financial flows. What do you do when the TV cameras show up? Like all of these different practical things. So experiencing that and watching how the thing kind of collapsed in on itself, um, I really, I'm not really interested in large scale anymore because we'll get another opportunity and another one and another one. They're going to keep happening. Um, but I want to be ready, <laughs> you know, next time the wave comes, I want to be, I want to be confident that in each of these cities around the world, there's like a, a, a significant cohort of people who know how to hold a group. Um, I don't even know many people that know how to hold a group of five people, to be honest. And 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 that's before you even get to the scale of 50. Like 50 is difficult. 50, you're going to have to deal with trauma. You're going to have to deal with conflict. You're going to have to deal with difficult power dynamics. Uh, and a lot of the Occupy camps were thousands, you know. Um, and maybe the last point I'll say on that before I hear what else is in the room is the reason that I actually try to defer people's attention away from the large scale is because the process of doing this work changes who we are. It changes how we think, it changes how we see, it changes what we perceive. And so as you become competent to work with five people, to become like, uh, uh, to see yourself in your proper place as part of a network of relationships rather than just as a node, as an atom that floats through space disconnected, uh, your whole way of seeing the world changes. And, and, and my experience is the more that I've got into this, the more I keep changing. And so I want to talk with people who are going through that change about what the large scale looks like 
and they're just they're kind of rare and hard to come by <laughs> and i don't want to i don't want to i don't want to have a conversation with someone who doesn't know how to organize five people and then we talk about how to change the world like it's just not it's not relevant like people's people are going to have some good values they're going to have some good maybe some good ideas but they're not going to be very pragmatic so yeah that's why i'm like that's why it's called micro solidarity i put it in the name so we don't even talk about the large scale <laughs> Thanks, great. Um, can I ask a question, like a very practical one? Um, so like, um, currently I'm part of a network where um, like the source is having a hard time. Like right now we're still eight people and she's actually, she's like at heart, she's someone who's very people oriented and human centric. But as I was saying before, like we actually scale not only on, on only both our light and our shadows, right? So, um, and oftentimes we see people who like to help people and are people centric are the ones who actually always put themselves last, right? And that actually can become a huge shadow. And, um, and a very practical struggle that I observed then is that um, as source, she doesn't know if her responsibility should be around holding space and capacity for the structures to emerge where the relational spaces can happen, or she should actually be more responsible for the business projects and the strategy. And um, I don't know if this is something that you guys have seen before. And of course she feels very responsible for both, but then of course it feels like a, like a dichotomy rather than something that is integrated. So very curious about your, your, your experiences on this. Mm, just a, just a, just an easy question <laughs> it's really complex <laughs> eh? it's really complex it's basically there's no there's no straightforward answer i think and 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 that's why i retreat back into my abstractions which is like um uh, social fabric and 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 learning loops so like learning loops as in we don't know what's the right thing to do for the next three months what if we prioritize the business and then we really make sure that we stop and integrate what we've learned and we choose what we're going to do for the next three months like that that um, being in the uncertainty and the complexity and, and running experiments to get real feedback and to increase your intelligence in the system by doing stuff. But the reason I said social fabric before learning loops is because everyone that's heard of agile is now, they think they're doing learning loops all the time, but they're not because people, if people don't trust each other, they're not actually giving you real data. They're mm. like, they're going through the motions of a meeting and they're like, mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yes, we're on iteration 273.4, but you haven't actually been exchanging real data. You're not doing an experiment. You're like doing a performance of an, exp of an experiment. <laughs> um, and so both, you know, you need the relational. Uh, you need people to be genuinely feeling like they can be honest with each other. They have that sense of safety and confidence that their voice matters. And you need to be trying stuff. Um, and, and it's kind of this, you know, uh, that, that's why I often use the heartbeat. It's kind of like this, there's the in, there's the inflow and the outflow and both of them kind of need to be running simultaneously. Yeah. I, I love the learning loop with the, um, depths that are lost true learning. So yeah, thanks. I find that sometimes I'm um, the traumatizer and sometimes I'm the traumatized, but there's always um, healing over and over and over and over again, the, the, the scars of interacting with others in the world. And I'm just wondering if you're, you have any um, thoughts about um, accelerating both, we talk about the internal, but also the the restoring mutualism is you know any any thoughts about that yeah yeah and you mentioned the fractal before michael and it made me realize um there was a mistake in my diagram like it was a really it was really the wrong move to to show like there's a one circle in the middle and then these expanding circles like the, the circles just keep going down infinitely small right uh it just keeps going and one way to think about that is like you know there's different kinds of therapeutic modalities that think about the person in terms of his parts Mm -hmm. um like internal family systems is one that my friends are into at the moment 
um, where we consider like, oh, there's a part of me who wants this. There's a part of me that feels that. Um, mm. And we can actually consider relationships between the parts of me. And that's where you get at a lot of the trauma and healing and like, why am I being, what, there's a part of me that's incredibly uptight about how this interaction is going and like, how can that, how can we help that part relax? Um, but you can keep going even further down the net into generational lineage. Like, what did we pick up? What are the lessons that I learned from my parents who learned from his parents who learned from, his, you know, that goes, that goes back and back and back. So um, that's the other reason why it's called micros because so much of it's focused on really, really doing that deep kind of internal interrogation and getting right down into the details because yeah as someone else said before like we do scale our shadow as well as our light and mm -hmm. uh every every organization every community i've been in is like a giant um manifestation of the founding personalities you know with these extra things bolted on but <laughs> it's like you can see that the, the character is just like extended like i don't know transformers or something <laughs> <laughs> so that it's completely essential and yeah i regret not including it on the slide catherine what's on your mind last question and then we'll um hi um this is it's very tactical co comment question as i think about networks one of the networks that i'm involved with is seth godin's um uh, the carbon almanac and so i'm just going to throw that i don't know if people are familiar with it and I'm just curious, and if you're not familiar with it, it's kind of an irrelevant question, but I'm just curious, it's, it, there's hundreds of people in it. It's very active. They're based on discord, discourse, which is kind of a, I, I don't, you know, whatever you feel about the platform, but I'm just curious about it as a comment of if anybody has familiar with it and any insights into why it's so contagious and I think, I think successful throwing it out there. Okay, <laughs> with that, Alicia, mm -hmm. I'll put it back to you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you all. Thank you for all your questions. And thank you, Rich, for being with us and uh, yeah, supporting us in keeping having this conversation on this topic. So thank you all. There will be more uh, to come on Thriving Networks. And yeah, it's the moment you can unmute and say goodbye and see you soon. And take care. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.